Well, thank you guys so much. This is awesome to be here. I'm so excited. I see all of your faces and I recognize a lot of you. I've spoken to a lot of you on the phone and it's the first time I've actually seen your faces, which is really cool. Um, for the rest of you, I'll just introduce myself uh, so you have a little bit of background. Um, I'm one of the newest members of the Skyline team and I'm the alumni development manager. So it's like my job to support all alumni in Skyline, which is such a gift because it's such an extraordinary community of people. And um, that's been my experience in every phone call. And it's been a total joy to start this journey. And, and, and it's fun to do this in this context. Like I was so excited about the idea of doing this virtually. I mean, the, the, the impact that we can have as an organization just it multiplies exponentially in this format. So it's super exciting to be here. Um, the, I think one of the cool things about having a weekly just catch up like this, one, I think it's really important to keep it like short and sharp, really intentional, and just have everyone come and take like a gold nugget away that they can kind of think about and process through the week. So it doesn't feel like a giant time commitment or energy commitment, but a way to really connect and, and think about things that are really relevant in the moment. So, you know, obviously at the moment, everybody, it's the first time the whole world has been engaged in one crisis at the same time. I mean, it's, it's pretty intense. And I hope that this quick session here will have you guys get a sense for the way these sessions will work in the sense that looking at stuff that's relevant to us in the moment and, and really creating a mindset that can empower us to really be with it in a whole new way. Um, I think that the most significant thing about the coronavirus situation is the fact that it's unprecedented. So there's nothing like it that we have in our repertoire, our memories, our experience in the past that we can kind of relate to. So the fact that it's unprecedented is really important. My coaching practice is very much about all the stuff that happens in our unconscious minds. And what, when something's unprecedented, our unconscious minds kind of freak out. And there's amazing science behind why that happens. So your unconscious mind loves predictability. It loves for you to be able to predict what's going to happen next in your life. The reason why is because if it can predict what's going to happen, it knows that you're going to be safe. It knows that you've probably done it in the past. And if you do it again, you'll be safe in the future, right? So it loves that. Its job, your mind's job is to protect you and to regulate your body and all the systems in your body. And it will even forego that in order to protect you. So when something like the coronavirus happens, it's going berserk in the background. The other reason is that it wants to repeat patterns. It loves when you are repeating patterns from the past. In fact, the National Science Foundation in America did this study. That's like a foundation. They get have about a $7 billion budget and they just research stuff relating to human science. They found that human beings have 35 to 40 thoughts per minute. And of those thoughts, 80% are typically negative and 95% are repetitive. So we are like machines for repeating the past. So you think about, you know, the coronavirus coming along and predict, there's no predictability. Predictability means we're safe. It tells our mind that we're safe because it can predict the future. No predictability. Um, all the negative thoughts are spiraling out of control and there's no, all of our major patterns in life are completely disrupted. You know, everything's changed. Now we're in isolation. Our patterns have to completely change. So what happens when that happens is um, most of you probably would have come across um, Maslow and his hierarchy of human needs. I think this model is totally relevant right now. I'll just give you a very, very, very generalized version of it. I'll just make sure you guys can see it. See, that is such a bad triangle. Oh my God. Okay. I'm trying to see what you can see here. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Okay. So Maslow had a theory that human beings have core needs and they're graded. So at the base and the kind of foundation needs are your needs like uh, they're the most basic needs, which are survival needs. So food, shelter, clothing, warmth, safety's in there, um, you know, protection from cold, protection from heat, just survival-based stuff, right? So those are our basic needs. The next tier, um, which is probably a lot bigger than that, 
The next tier are our psychological needs. And those are needs like belonging and love, um, that kind of like our connection needs. And up here are, is our self-fulfillment needs. So this would be like um, our self-expression and giving back. And what happens when we, when our patterns get disrupted and things aren't predictable, that if we're floating around in these parts of the pyramid, that completely gets disrupted. Fear shows up and we jump down to this level and we hang out down here in survival mode. So we fear triggers us to go down here and go, hold on, my safety is not intact. Uh, this is what's happening in the world. Nothing's predictable. I'm going to hang out down here for a while, which completely changes the way we see things. So the reason why, even though we know logically that Australia produces toilet paper and the coronavirus isn't a gastrointestinal thing, even though we know that in our heads, we're down here in survival mode. All of that goes away. We're like, we just can't think that way. And we are suddenly rushing to the store to buy toilet paper, even though we know that it's not a problem. So we're reacting from a part of our brain that is so primal. It is literally like the fight or flight. It's our reptilian brain. It's where, where we, you know, our, our body chemistry changes. Like we get this rush of, um, uh, chemicals that has us feel that fight or flight thing and it has us do crazy things and that's what people are doing around the world so what's really interesting is that i mean we when we know this we can do something about it we can actually take actions and create thoughts that can kind of interrupt that um so i'm gonna have to erase this So what happens what happens in your brain when you're when you drop down to baseline survival and if you're if you're already living there like at a at a level where you literally are looking for food shelter and clothing you just kind of sink further down this this happens at every stage what happens when you go to that level where you're just focused on your safety is that you go to a part of your brain, which is called your basal ganglia. It's kind of known as the primitive brain. It's where all of our sort of super ancient um, habits of thought live. So it's all fight or flight. It's all, you know, survival. And those are habits of mind that loop. So we go there and it just becomes this looping pattern where we don't really know how to get out of it. We know we can see logically that it's not right, but we don't know how to get out of it. Where we normally reside as human beings, which is what separates us from other animals, is this part of our brain, which is your prefrontal cortex, is where you do all of your rational thought, all your logic, where you're creative, where you have empathy. We go from here, so when you drop to the bottom of the pyramid, you go from here to here, into these habits of mind that just loop. And there's a cool trick to get out of that. So if you're, if you notice yourself down here, like worrying or becoming upset, you might notice like your physiology changes, your heart rate increases, your palms get sweaty, your stomach tightens. That's when you go from being kind of worried about something in your mind to actually feeling the stress in your body there's a cool way to interrupt that. And this can work too. If, you, if, that, if that stress goes from anxiety, then down to like a full-blown panic attack, part of what happens in that situation is that you're, you're in this looping cycle that's creating this chemistry in your body and your body's going, why is Leah freaking out? I can't see any physical danger anywhere. Um, this must be really scary. I'm gonna give her a shot of cortisol which is gonna amplify all these physical sensations. And that's the fight or flight thing that happens. And she's gonna get the hell out of there because it's dangerous there, right? So it creates this, this whole system of chemistry in your body that keeps you from thinking logically about things. So a cool 
a cool trick. One of the things I would love to leave you guys with today is just a few really practical strategies on how, when this happens, is it making sense? I know you guys can't talk, but is it making sense, this whole thing? Yeah, cool. When this happens, there are some cool strategies you can do that kind of, I don't know, they're like life hacks. They're like, they, they're kind of, like our minds are amazing things, but, but when you think about the fact that we spend so much time in this part of the brain, in these kind of situations, when really what we need to do is be thinking, it, it just doesn't seem very smart. So there are some tricks to how you can kind of like interrupt that cycle. One is that this part of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, that's where you do your thinking. So if you notice yourself down here looping in these really negative thoughts, which is our, you know, that's our default mode anyway. We have 35 to 40 thoughts a minute, 80% are negative. The reason why is because if we predict the worst case scenario, we can look after ourselves. Like we've got all the bases covered, right? Is that a productive way to live your life? Absolutely not, but that's kind of our protection mode. If you can be down there, and get from there to up here by kind of tricking your brain, it's kind of cool. So a way to do that is to start by actually doing the thing that you would do up there, which is to think. So very, very, very simply, I mean, I, I have this thing about, I can't watch really violent movies because it leaves all these terrible images in my head that literally like stick around for years. And if I have something come into my head, I use this trick. I do something like something that takes some thinking, not a lot of thinking, right? But like count by 13s. So 13, 26, 39. You have to move into this part of your brain. You just, you, you can't be looping in these negative habits and do that work. And it's so simple and it takes you there. And if you do it for five or 10 seconds, it gives your brain that refocus and then it'll be like cool Lee, it's doing this now right which is hilarious in some ways another thing you can do is like say the alphabet but skip a letter or skip two letters just something that has you have to use that part of your brain it takes you out of this looping habit um what's another one you could literally just do something like say um two things i know one is that australia produces toilet paper and two coronavirus is not a gastro and by the time you've said all that your mind is now here, not here, not looping in that negativity. That's the only thing that we need to be able to do is to be able to notice that we're doing it and have that self-awareness and have at least one simple strategy to get us out of that. Um, there was something else in that, what was it? Okay, so another really cool strategy that when you're in fight or flight mode, you notice that your breathing increases quite a bit even if you're like just on public transport or you're walking to something, you can tell that with your heart rate and everything's changing that your, your breathing changes. Your mind, when it feels you breathing quickly, it goes, oh, there's a problem here. She must be in trouble. I can't see anything. That makes it even more scary because it's probably just something you're thinking that it will amp up that chemical release and eventually potentially that shot of cortisol, which you don't want because that's full on. And it's actually, it takes a while to recover from that. It's very hard to, to snap out of that. If you can, before that happens, actually take deep breaths. And I know that sounds a bit, I don't know. I, you know, before I learned the science behind it, I always thought deep breathing sounded a bit, you know, I don't know. I didn't really think much of it. <laughs> But the science behind it is that when you take a deep breath, what it's communicating to your mind is that everything's okay. Because if you're getting chased by a saber toothed tiger, you know, 50,000 years ago, which was when we got programmed with all this stuff, you weren't taking deep breaths. You were taking really short, really fast breaths. And that was a communication to your mind what you were dealing with and what kind of support you needed. So of course you'd get the adrenaline and the cortisol and you'd be on your way, right? So if you take deep breaths, it's actually a communication that things are good. Like you're, you couldn't be in harm's way if you're taking deep breaths. That's so simple. You know, I used to, first time I ever did any public speaking, I'd be in my car and I would like be hoping that, you know, a plane dropped out of the sky and landed on my car so I didn't have to go. I was that scared. And I would just take deep breaths and it was, you know, it didn't cure me hundred percent, but it, would, it took me over the edge where I didn't get that full on sort of anxiety about it. Um, 
Another thing that's really cool when we were talking about this pyramid here, and this is an awesome way to think about stuff in life, is that, you know, in this space of self-actualization is what he called it. One of the elements of that is giving back, is being in a space where you can see that you've got all this stuff, like you're sorted, so much so that you have just this inner kind of need, want, drive to give back on some level. When you're here and you're looping in this negativity to actually take actions that are here and here is one way to be intentional about where, where you're sitting. You don't necessarily have to feel like, you know, connecting with someone in this level or giving back, but to actually take the action actually has you be there. So like, um, I was talking to Allison actually the other day, we were just kind of brainstorming stuff on the phone about, you know, the coronavirus and that kind of stuff. And an idea that I kind of had floating around in my head kind of came into the conversation, which was to just do a letterbox drop in my street to elderly, well, to everybody, because I don't know everyone on my street, but just to say, look, you know, if you're an elderly person in this road, um, shout out and, you know, I'll support you uh, going to the store and getting your groceries or whatever it is. And, um, and it's like taking that action in the face of my own fear and concern actually takes me out of here and puts me here. And it takes me out of here and puts me here. It's by deliberately taking those actions, being intentional about creating something versus waiting for something to land on me or to change my mind. So one of the other, um, like pieces of gold, I think in this whole format that we're doing here is that in this level, that's where human beings get their need for connection. And that's where, where that need is really met. So it's very easy, especially when we're asked to, you know, lock down and isolate to be at home and just assume we'll be cool with that. Well, we actually have a human need to connect to people, to connect in a community and connect one-on-one. -on -one. And so to be intentional about, filling that need for yourself is really important. Um, and that's like, that might actually take something like a new, trying to create a new habit. Like Jane was saying, like, like being intentional about connecting with like one person a day, joining in this context, you know, um, when you're flipping through social media, don't just flick through, actually leave a comment or send a message. So engage. I think those will be really, really important um, small things that we can do. Um, and the only other thing I had was to use the media intentionally and stay informed in a very intentional way to not just scroll through and read everything and read the things that have the flashiest headlines, find sources that you believe and you trust. Uh, like I've got one, the Washington Post for me is like, I know that I can read that and I can get the facts I need without being hooked into this drama and Hyster you know, hysteria about the whole thing. So finding something like that. And if anyone would like any, you know, advice on that and how to create that for yourself in Australia, um, you know, reach out to me. I'm a hundred percent here and that's across the board. Like I'm here for you guys. So reach out at any stage. If you want to, you know, I know everyone's got an experience. I think one of the things is that we all kind of, because we've never done this before, we all kind of feel like we're doing it for the first time, but in, I think our default setting is to feel like we're the only ones who are doing it the way we are doing it. And it's really helpful to know that other people are doing it just the way you're doing it and processing stuff just the way you're processing stuff. Um, you know, there is no real normal here, but at the same time, it's all just all your, you know, how we're managing this is all very normal because it's just what's coming out. <laughs>